the, the bottom line is you need to be in a good market. You need to be in the Southeast, you need to be in the Midwest where people and jobs are still migrating even when there's a recession and it's more affordable to live in Knoxville or to live in Jacksonville than it is to live in New York City or California. So choose a good market to invest in. Choose a market that has a plethora of jobs and choose a market where population is growing. It doesn't and have to be where you live either. Yep, exactly. Rockstar Nation, thanks so much for listening. Don't forget to stay to the end where our guests will be offering a free gift. As you know, all of our guests offer a free gift and all of these gifts can be found on the Agent Success Toolbox. You could find that by going to hybendigital.com backslash toolbox or simply texting the word toolbox to 444-999. That's toolbox to 444-999. I am going to put today's free gift in today's show notes but if you want all of them including gifts from most of our guests that have come on the show just go to the agent success toolbox so the big question is this how do most agents who don't have access to the secrets that the top agents in our industry hoard to themselves grow and prosper in today's real estate environment that's the question and this video podcast is the answer. I'm Pat Hyben, and welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. Do the math. It's worth every single dollar. That's a title of a comment that I got on my certified listing agent course from Rebus University. It's from Bill Reig. This is what Bill says. Bill says, looking to take your listing presentation to the next level? I've closed 100 appointments since I took Pat's certified listing agent course. Five appointments, five new clients, 60 days. Boom. Do the math. It's worth every single dollar. Thanks, Bill. But listen, guys, I am offering this to you if you haven't already taken it because so many brokers and teams make their agents take it before they do a single listing appointment. But if you haven't taken it, you can go to rebusuniversity.com and get it now. Now, here's the thing. For 30 days, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you that course. I'm going to give you the buyer agent course, which teaches you how to close every single series buyer that calls on the phone or emails. This certified team agent course is taught by Jeff Cohn, one of America's top agents on how to build a team from zero to hero to hundreds and hundreds of units every year, step by step. It's like a 12 hour course plus seven other courses. Yes, you heard that right all for a measly 127 bucks a month. If you were to go to Rebus University and buy these courses individually, it costs you over $10,000. But today, if you go to futureofrealestatetraining.com, that's futureofrealestatetraining.com, you'll learn what Bill Reek did, which is how to close 100% of the listing points you go on, quite impressive. And you'll learn all the other incredible details provided in the 11 five-star courses that are offered. Yeah, it's like all you can eat bizarre. You go in now and you pay 127 bucks a month. If you can eat all 11 courses in one month, that's all you pay is a buck 97. This is a bargain, guys. Get it now. Future of real estate training.com. All right, real estate rock stars. I got a great couple of guests here today. Mr. Jake and Gino are on the line, and we're going to talk about something fascinating um, and something you guys need to think about. If you haven't already thought about before, you know, I'm a big proponent of real estate investing, and these guys are real estate investing masters, and we're going to talk about why real estate agents don't invest and why they should invest and what's going on with the investment market in the future future as far as single family homes, as far as multifamily, and as far as everything uh, real estate wise. So I'm excited to have them on there. Jake and Gino, welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. Pat, how are we doing? Thanks for having us, Pat. Hey guys, why don't you just fill everybody in on, on who you are so they get to know you better. Well, uh, I'm Jake and uh, I got my friend Gino down there for the folks on YouTube and we are multifamily investors. Uh, you know, going back to the end of the Great Recession, I was a, a drug rep and, and Gino was a pizza guy and we were looking for more out of our lives. Uh, I was in a job that was doing layoffs just about every year and they would say, go home and sit by the phone. 
and we'll let you know if you have a job or not going to the next year. And, and that wasn't a way that I enjoyed living. I didn't have control over my life. And, you know, it's one of my sole purposes in life to provide for my family. And that's extremely important to me. So I was looking for more out of life. Uh, ended up moving to Tennessee. And, you know, at the time, Gino uh, was close and we started looking at deals in Knoxville. And I don't want to say the rest is history, but that's kind of what kicked off our real estate investing career. Uh, we started buying in, um, you know, some things that we call mom and pop investments. Uh, we we're getting in a lower, you know, price per door. Some of our early investments, we were buying stuff at 30000 a unit. And it, it worked really well. So wait a minute, let me get this straight. So you guys didn't do what most people do and, and buy like single family homes first, right? You like you went from owning a pizza place uh, and uh, selling uh, pharmaceutical drugs to buying an apartment building. Uh, I didn't want another job. I already had a job. I had a restaurant making, you know, W-2 salary. I had a decent living. I wanted multifamily and education time. Like, what made you think that though? Well, like, what, like, you know, most people think, oh yeah, I'm just going to buy a house and rent it out. That's it's what the landlord job. does. Yeah. I like that. My mom had a fourplex and if she could do it, she's an immigrant from Italy and she's collecting the rents. I had a restaurant with three apartments upstairs. It snows. We lose nice. And she's getting the rent every month. So I said to myself, I don't want to buy one at a time. And plus in New York to buy a house with 300 grand to make two grand a month, it, the numbers didn't work. So I said, let me buy multiple units. I can at least scale it. And I had a fourplex. I went into mobile home park. I didn't like the mobile home park space, not because of the space, because I wasn't educated. I bought a strip mall, bought the strip mall wrong, wasn't educated. And I just saw multifamily as, hey, I can buy four units here, six units there, and I can manage it while I have the restaurant. And then when the day comes, when I make X amount, I can leave the restaurant. That was my game plan. So let's let's talk about this. So so you still had the restaurant. You still were selling drugs, um, and and you said we're going to buy an apartment building. And tell me about this first apartment building you bought. Yeah, there's a little bit more of the backstory too that I think is really important because this is coming off the back of the recession. This is coming off the back of healthcare reform, and I'm going around to all these doctors' offices where these guys used to have their autonomy. And now they're getting gobbled up by these medical groups, okay? There's one doctor left in Westchester County that I was very close with that retained his private practice, and it's because he didn't need it. And I was getting very close with this gentleman. I, I tried to find out why. I said, why are all these other folks getting gobbled up and you retain your autonomy and you still own your practice? And it was because he owned real estate. And he started coaching me, and then Gino started coaching me. And I learned that owning these real assets, saving up some money so you can repurpose it into assets that will pay you every month, will put you in a position of control. And that's what I sought and that's what I really desired and I, I really st strove to accomplish for myself and that's what we've done. So you, you're kind of going back and say, well, you didn't flip houses, you didn't do that. I think flipping houses early on is great for somebody. I think someone that's a real estate agent that wants to go out there and sell homes and make money on it, but they need to repurpose it into assets that are going to pay them every month. So there was a, there was a very like uh, sound mental process behind what we were doing and it came from Dr. Neshua, it came from Gino uh, that I was leaning on to really try to understand how am I going to make life better for myself? And that's where this came from early on in the beginning. I never, you know, owned another business before this. I, the first thing I ever bought was a 25 unit uh, apartment complex. And it was because we wanted something that was going to pay us. That's nice. Okay. So you start out with a 25 unit right off the bat. And, um, and at what point did you say, hey, you know what, um, I don't need to f uh, make pizzas anymore, right? I don't need to, uh, you know, sell pharmaceuticals anymore. How did you know, you know, because I think that's what a lot of people are afraid of is, is go, you know, dropping things to pick up new things. That's a great question. For me, I had six kids. We homeschool our kids. I wanted to get out of New York. Everyone needs to get clarity on what they want. I knew what I wanted. I just had to figure out how to do it. And for me, multifamily was the way to do it. Our first asset was bought in February of 13. I probably started educating myself three years before that. So it took me a good three years. It took Jake and I 18 months to get our first deal. So after that first deal, 18 months, we got our next deal three months after that. And then we got our third deal six months after that. So a year into this partnership, we have 200 units with cost segregation, Jake is able to leave his job because he's got property management fees coming in also because we're managing our own assets. So if you play the long game, it's like the farmer planting the seed. You need to water that seed. You're not going to get paid day one. It's a process. So for me, it took me three years to get out of the restaurant from the day I bought my first asset with Jake 
It's a five to six year plan. And with all the kids that I had living in New York, that's what it took me because I kept going on and the cost segregation helped me and the ability to save money helped me and the ability to have a healthy financial statement. You can't live above your means. You can't have Parkinson's law where you make more money and then you spend more just because you make more. We're not entitled to that. We don't deserve anything. What you deserve to do is to be financially smart and financially sound. The money that you make, the money that you refi out of these deals, you put into the next deal. We've been able to refi over $9 million from our portfolio. I don't have a Lamborghini in the driveway. I don't go on extravagant vacations. I buy assets and now I don't have to buy any more assets. That's the idea of this. And now you're living off of that, saving for college, saving for retirement is the middle class mentality. Buying an asset that will allow you to pay for that event is what you want to do. Because when that event is over, you still have that asset that's going to pay for the other event. I have one property that's going to pay for my six kids' education. And I'm still going to have that property when they're done with college. I've got the depreciation, I've got the principal pay down, and I've got the asset appreciating. So that's the difference between having a wealthy mindset and a middle class mindset. And it takes a long time to develop it. But if you're around the right people like Jake and my partner, Mike, and the Jake and Gino community, you can, I guess, pull yourself through and really live up to those ideals. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and of course, that's my belief too. You know, I've, that's how I've, you know, quit working in, in multiple ways. Um, so here's the question, right? It's 2020. You guys it got started like in the future, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it does. Weird, isn't it? Mm-hmm. 20 years ago was the year 2000. I graduated high school that year. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that crazy? You know, and someone said to me the other day, if you're born this year, you'll be 80 in the year 3000. Now that's bizarre, right? Um, so, um, uh, okay. So let's talk about this, right? You're, you're uh, a lot's changed right? A lot has changed. The syndication um, novelty or syndication, um, uh, let's call it uh, um, tool res- tool belt. Being, yeah, being a respected asset class is at an all-time high, right? Um, even real estate agents out there um, know of somebody or have heard of somebody who is, who is putting together a deal for an apartment building um, where five years ago, certainly they weren't right. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about that in reality. So you gotta, you know, this show is for real estate agents. So a lot of agents are like, Hmm, you know, I have an opportunity. I could just buy a single family home and rent it out and be in control, or I can get into one of these syndication deals that are coming across my desk. What, what advice do you have for the listeners as to how to do this right? Yeah, I think there's another path that we're not talking about as well. And that's sort of the path that we took is that you can do also partnerships on a smaller deal if you want and then scale up as well. So we use it all and we're not, you know, well, we don't, excuse me, we don't use it all because we're not buying single family units because we don't think that makes sense uh, because it's hard to scale. Um, So, you know, if a 50 unit or something like that comes across our desk, we'll still look at that. But I think if someone's out there and saying they got a couple hundred grand or they can put a couple hundred grand together with themselves and a partner, I think that they should consider syndication if they don't want to be that hands on because I think it's a great vehicle. Um, But they should also consider maybe I want to partner up with somebody and hire a management company and go look and see, is there a 30 unit? Is there a 40 unit deal out there? And and so what numbers should they use to decide whether that's a good deal or not? So it's getting tighter, like if we're going to be honest with ourselves. You know, back when we started, we were fortunate to buy some things at an 8% cap rate. Um, so I think that a, uh, for a smaller, you know, size asset class, I think a 7 cap would be good uh, to target right now. I think it depends so on So what the he means by this, guys, is he's saying, like, if you put in, uh, if you buy something for cash, the mm-hmm. cash that you're going to get on it at the end of the year, this is not with a mortgage, is 7%. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and as far as a cash on cash, which is another term that you may have heard before, it's, it's what the return is on the cash that you invest with a mortgage, let's say. So what do you guys recommend for cash on cash? Cause I think that's easier for real estate agents out there listening to this to think about, okay, I got an extra 50 grand that I saved up for my commissions. I'm going to put it in a, a, whether it's a syndicated deal or a partnership with some other people. Um, what should they assume to get back every year on their cash? 
So I think that it, it's all dependent on the market, but anywhere from like an eight to 12%, uh, I think is a phenomenal cash on cash return. And keep in mind alongside this, if you're, if you're a realtor and you're participating in the management, you know, this is something you want to talk to your CPA about. So not only are you getting that cash on cash, but you can do something called a cost segregation study where you're going to actually be able to accelerate the depreciation on that asset, which is going to help tremendously in terms of uh, your taxable income. Uh, you're going to be paying paying down the mortgage over time. So there's a tremendous amount of other benefits that are going to come out of this besides just the cash on cash return that comes from the property, and, which is uh, still pretty damn good. Pat, I want to mention there's something that we teach. It's called, I, we call it the three pillars of real estate. So when either a single family investor or a multifamily investor is looking at a deal, these are the three pillars you need to look at and see if it's a good deal. The first one's the market cycle. What part of the market cycle are you in? Are you in a buyer's, buyer's market phase or seller's market phase? There's four different phases. You can Google market cycle. You have to learn the market cycles because you're not buying certain assets in certain types. So learn where you are in the market cycle when you're buying these assets. The second one is the debt. What kind of debt are you putting on this asset? Is it hard money? Is it private money? Are you using agency debt? Are you using community bank financing? So, you know, Kiyosaki says there's two things in real estate. It's debt and taxes. So, I mean, if you can get great debt on this property and you have long rate, long term fixed rate financing, you're taking that risk off the table. And the third one is the exit strategy. You talked about syndication. Sometimes syndication limits your ability to have that exit strategy where you need to sell. Jake and I don't need to sell. Our exit strategy is if we want to sell and we've made a ton of money and our return on equity sucks, we can sell it at a big gain. So, think about those three, everybody your market cycle, your debt and your exit strategy. Write those down. Every time you analyze a deal, make sure what you're going to do with that deal down the road when you're exiting it because you're going to buy it. Make sure you can sell it to somebody if you're going to sell it. And if not, make sure you're going to be able to hold it and cash flow that baby. And make sure anybody that's out there that's a realtor or whatever that thinks they may qualify for this, the, the real estate professional designation, talk to your CPA about that because it can be a tremendous wealth builder for you. Uh, and, and, and basically, you know, this is a a show for real estate agents, right? Probably 80% of the audience here is real estate agents. So you guys qualify. So, you know, um, that's a no brainer. If you're not doing that, you're a clown because um, it's, it's a no brainer. Tribeofmillionaires.com. Guys, write that down. Rockstar Nation got a free special offer for you. Now, I've just written a book and it's just been published. Co authored it with David Osborne, who's been on this show multiple times. If you don't know David, he is one of the top execs at Keller Williams Real Estate, was personally mentored for the last two decades by Gary Keller himself. And he's in all kinds of businesses. His bio and explanation and everything is in this book. But anyways, David and I got together. We decided to write a book. We called it Tribe of Millionaires. And I guarantee you, it's going to change your life. To find out more, just go to tribeofmillionaires.com. We're going to give it to you absolutely free. Only thing we ask in return is, of course, number one, you pay the shipping. Not a big deal. But number two, that you go on Amazon and write us a review. We're really looking to get an incredible amount of reviews. And because of that, we're giving this book away for free. Go to tribeofmillionaires.com today. Hey, real estate agents and rock stars. If you're getting value out of the content in this episode, make sure you like the video and subscribe to this channel. Also, click the little bell icon to be notified about upcoming episodes. And I would also love it if you left a comment and shared the most impactful tips and tactics you've learned from the knowledge shared in this episode, or even maybe make a suggestion requesting a topic of what you'd like to learn in future episodes. I welcome any feedback below. Now, back to the episode. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, um, all right. So let's talk about this, right? So the last decade has been amazing um, for multiple different investment strategies, right? Multiple asset classes. Do you know how much, and I'm going to just go with single family, I'm going to go with multifamily because that's your guy's game. Do you know how much the multifamily asset class has increased in the last 10 years? What would you would, say, Jake? What do you say by increase? What are you saying, like the values? Uh, yeah, let's say you're at a hundred grand, and you and or, or let, yeah, the values. Let's just say the values. Let me answer that question. 
I know, so some Jake, of, and some of our properties that we, you know, it's what we know and it's more than doubled because we've taken and keep in mind, guys, this is based on your net operating income. Okay. These are, these are cash flowing assets. So it's going to be uh, looked at and viewed as the income approach. So I'll go back to our third deal. It was doing $450 a month when we took over. Okay. And rents. And rents, you know, per unit and 136 units. And, and now these things are up over 800 in, in many uh, of the units. So you're seeing a tremendous the cash surge. flow is, has doubled. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and so you're seeing like when we're going to win. The value has, has certainly more than doubled. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, so what you're doing is, and then we'll, you know, we're, we have tremendous cash flow on these and we're able to refinance them. We still hold them and, and they still can, you know, continue to cash flow. So you refinance some of your, your equity out of it as it's run up, that's tax free for the time being, and you're able to continue to cash flow and manage it. So it's been a, you know, fantastic, uh, just overall run for, for us. Yeah. So what would, what would you say to somebody listening? That's, that's like, well, you know what, that's all well and good, but, I had a hundred grand um, in 2010, and I put it in the stock market, and now it's worth four hundred fifty thousand dollars because the stock market has increased four and a half times since then. You know, um, what what do, what do you have to say to that's, that? Let's that's kind of easy because I was a W-2 person at the time and, you know, I had money in the stock market and I saw in 2010 that it, it, I lost it all. And then it, you know, it came back up and I have no interest in owning paper because inflation is the silent killer. So if you're out there and you feel good about having assets that don't pay you every month that make you look rich on, on paper and then are actually devaluing because you're not keeping up with inflation, our rents go up with inflation. Okay. That's the beautiful thing about this. And so I have, uh, you know, I went from being maybe, you know, having a net worth of $150,000, you know, back when I was a W2, like the person you're referring to that got rich on paper up over 300,000 to having a net worth of over 10 million since I got into the multifamily real estate space. And so it's, it's just a mindset shift that you want hard assets that are going to pay you every month that are, that are going to um, allow you to then go out and buy more assets and you're playing a different game. So, I, I think that while my multifamily has, you know, yes, gone up a lot, um, I think it's more outpaced the, the amount of net worth than anything that I would have been able to do on the W-2 side. Um, so it's just, you know, it's been tremendous from that perspective. I want everyone out there to Google a fractional banking system to see what kind of banking yeah. system we have. Banks lend on a reserve. If they have a dollar in reserves, they lend out 10, 12, 14. So what does that do? It causes massive inflation. 1971, we got off the gold standard by Nixon. We are in a debt revolution. It, Fred is printing money, printing, printing money. You have to the use value it. of your money is going down. You have a hard asset. That's what's happened over the last five or six years. Between 1031, between negative interest rates, between money coming in from China, between the affordable housing crisis, all of these factors have elevated multifamily. And there's three places, Jake. What are the three fundamental human needs? Food, clothing, and-, and... And I think it's apartments now. I think we stopped worried about the <laughs> shelters. <laughs> Multifamily assets. Well, I think what people don't realize is that what you guys are doing and what all real estate investors do is they borrow money against them. So when you're comparing the stock market, $100,000 now is worth 450 or a million dollars is now worth four and a half million, where your 450 is worth 10 million. It's because it's leveraged. It's kind of like the same thing as if you did invest in the stock market, but you took out margin calls on all the stocks that you bought, which allowed you to double and triple and you know what I mean? Well, you're, playing, you're, you're playing a different tax game too, though. So I think that's key. That too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing I think we should all mention, I, we've, we've, uh, Jake and I both read this book called Big Shifts Ahead by Chris Porter. I think mm. everyone in the single family home space has to read the book. It can be a painful book. It's all about demographics. There's 72 million baby boomers and 72 million millennials. What do you think they're doing? They are renting. They're not buying. This multifamily, I think, in the long term is going to stay where it is because people don't want to buy. They, they're going to continue to rent. You know, it's funny is it, is about that, and, and I love that. I'm going to read that. Um, but it's, it's like the babe, the, the older generation lives in these older type houses and the younger generation would never buy that. Like they don't want to buy, they want all this new shit, right? Mm -hmm. They want this beautiful stuff. So the, the sellers are not attracted, attracting the buyers. Mm -hmm. And, and the other problem with that is 
the millennials have all this debt, right? They want to be transient. They want to be able to move from Phoenix to Knoxville to Jacksonville and pick up and leave. Why buy a house? Why have a mortgage? Why put three to 4% of your principal payments away for CapEx every year? It's not like it was 10 and 15 years ago where you could build equity and have that American dream. Right now, if you're buying at a house, you're buying it at the top end, a lot of these markets. So they don't view it as an asset like our generation did. And they know that it's work. They know that it's I think, quote unquote, a luxury to them. So to them, rent and then just have that lifestyle and not worry about worrying about the hot water heater. or. I think the maintenance too. Mice. I think a lot of them struggle with the maintenance component and have to sub a lot of it out. So it's different than when your yeah. dad probably went out and mowed the lawn and fixed the shit himself. But so. take a look at that demographic book because it'll talk to you about what's going on. I mean, you have a lot of immigrants coming in. They rent. You have women, single family households. They can't afford to buy homes. What happens when the recession hits and you can't qualify for a mortgage? Where are these people going? The, the bottom line is you need to be in a good market. You need to be in the Southeast. You need to be in the Midwest where people and jobs are still migrating even when there's a recession and it's more affordable to live in Knoxville or to live in Jacksonville than it is to live in New York City or California. So choose a good market to invest in. Choose a market that has a plethora of jobs and choose a market where population is growing. It doesn't I have to be where you live either. Yep, exactly. All right, cool. Tell me about the honeybee. The honeybee, I got it right here. We got the bee. So it's, it's, a, it's a parable uh, and it, it, you know, it loosely follows our journey from you know, the, the early gut punches because there's a lot of stings early on. And when you're, when you're an entrepreneur, um, you know, we started off, it was myself and Gino and with a 25 unit and we were trying to hire maintenance men and figure out our management company. And there's a lot of learning lessons that, uh, that take place. And so we, we documented that, we put it into a parable form and we showed the journey of a, a gentleman that, uh, you know, he met a mentor and he went on his journeys from, you know, buying a smaller asset and scaling up and having, you know, various streams of income, you know, as we do. And I think one of the keys to our success is the vertical integration. We control every piece of the process and that's what we teach in the honeybee. Uh, we manage ourselves. We do our own in-house you know, asset management. We do the syndication. We have a finance company and, and that level of control has really propelled uh, and uh, it's really cut costs for us um, as we've grown. And we know that what we're getting into, we, we have someone on the team with experience, so we're not getting the wool pulled over our eyes. So that's I, really been Jake, our approach to the business. It's really been a process though. So we just started out For fumbling sure. and mumbling and it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, we're doing all the work. It's not how can we do it, it's who can we do it. So we had the property management company, we hired property managers instead of Jake doing it, right? So there's a lot of that process. And the honeybee is like emblematic of what's going on. The honeybee is the worker. All it is is the honeybee is going out and making the honey. The person who owns the hive Noah and Tom who own the honeybee hive are the ones who make the money. Now it takes a long time to make honey and you have to pay those honeybees to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you can make that and put that connection in your brain, you're going to become really super wealthy doing so it. So you're saying you and you, Jake and Gino are hive owners. That's we right. Hive and, owners. and Pat and everyone else out there who's an entrepreneur, we want to own the hive. And sometimes we may pay our honeybees more than what we're making, but ultimately the value is in the equity and the value is in the, is in the creation of that business because you can always sell that hive off to somebody else and start another hive. It's pretty much capitalism 101, right? I mean, it's like Kiyosaki says, like the, 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 the A students work for the C students, you mm -hmm. know? That, I love that. Yeah. It's like you, you, no matter what, you're going to have, you need a lot of honeybees if you want to be successful. You got to get away from the honeybee. I think that's a, that's, a, that's a big challenge, especially for real estate agents because they're honeybees, right? They work really hard and they're very much in control of things. And if you want to scale your property, if you want to scale your properties, which is the reason why you guys went multifamily instead of, you know, buying single families here and there, uh, you, you got to let go of the honeybee and become a hive. I think Jake, Jake mentioned it. He mentioned his people, the systems, and the culture, those three. I think when we started to scale, we really wanted to figure out what our culture and our, our core values were. I mean, you have to figure out what your core values and what your mission statement are for you to grow. And it's okay. If you're doing $20 an hour work, you have to sub that work out. And it was hard for us to do it. But I love bookkeeping. I had to sub that work out because I can get somebody to do that for 35 bucks an hour and I can go close a deal. So I think the real estate agents have to figure out where their value is and be able to share the pie. We don't own 100% of all these pies, but if you own 10% of one pie, 20% of another pie, 30% of another pie, I mean, we have over, I have over 23 streams of revenue. So if six of them aren't doing well, 
I've got 17 other streams. So, so think of it that way. Think of growing it and being able to share. And once you can share and grow your network and grow your team, it all starts with the people. It really does. I wish I'd known this 10 years ago, but you know. I want to touch on something he just said though too, because there's been so many times where a, a realtor, a broker has brought me a deal and I'm thinking to myself, why the hell is this guy not buying it himself? You know, and there's so many times like there's, there's value in it. It's an off market transaction or something. And I'm thinking there's so much value in this. I cannot believe this guy is not trying to just. What, what do you think himself. the answer to that is? Cause this, this is such a great question for, for people. Well, one, one it's, it's, I think they get stuck in the mentality that this is my job and I need to make a rip off this. And I, I can't jeopardize me being a broker that they think I'm going to go and try to buy directly from him. Uh, and the other thing is that they're not even thinking about that. They're just thinking, I want the quick, you know, the quick fix so I can go pay the bills and, and you know, keep the, the, you know, cycle going. But I've just been like, you know, oh my God, how is this guy actually bringing this to me? And, you know, it's been something that set me free for the rest of my life. It's a hard so. one because this dopamine hit. It's that instant gratification. It's like cheating your trend to tell your children to put off and delay that gratification, save that money. So down the road, you have something to invest with. And for them, they get caught in the, in the hamster race where transactions are great. They're making great money every year. But that transaction, if you can put that off, transactions pay the bills, equity makes yeah. you rich. And it's really hard because I know that you're stuck in the grind and you can't see above that. But maybe if you're a realtor, you tell the seller, can I get some equity in this? If I can roll some of my transaction, some of my, you know, uh, broker fees in there. So that's one way of doing it, man. I, that's I what you that. should always do. I mean, mm -hmm. We've had guys on the show like that, that that's how they make, you know, that's what you should always do. I mean, mm -hmm. take a piece of it. Don't take a commission, yes. take a piece of it. Cause you don't have to pay taxes on it at that level yeah. too. Right. You mm -hmm. know, Pat, we did a owner finance 281 unit deal back in 2015. Mm. We actually got money back at the closing table and the thing paid us 60K last month and we, we paid the owner off about two years ago. Wow. Think about that. The yeah. realtor brought us this deal. We put nothing down. It was over two, almost 300 damn units and the thing paid us 60K last month. What the hell? Like right. that's, that's the kind of thing where I'm like, I just don't, I just don't get, hey, he made a nice, made a nice fee on it, but the thing pays us every month. Yeah. Think uh, of the logic, right? I mean, they're, mm -hmm. well, it's, it, you know, in their mind too, you know, in 2015, they, it, you know, they, they might've thought 2016 was going to crap out, you know? I mean, like, like they had maxed out. They, they, they there was no value to add, mm -hmm. you know, which I think is a concern now. Like, talk to me about that. Like, like, uh, how do you know when there's no more value to add in a certain areas that um, it seems like uh, these apartment buildings, right? Or even, or even single family homes have been sold three or four times in the last decade, right? How do you so it know? Doesn't know? It doesn't always have to come down to a value add play though. And I think that's a trap that a lot of guys get caught up in. Um, we did a deal. What was it? Last towards the end of last summer it was 143 units. And, you know, it was, it was just, it was like a 6.8 cap and it wasn't, there's not a tremendous value add on the thing, but it cash flows nicely. It's an asset that I, you know, I very much like owning and, you know, it just made sense. It was cash flow from day one and, and they're not easy to find. If we do two of these things a year, I mean, it's fantastic for us, but we have to look at a ton of deals. So uh, we're doing a deal right now. Uh, it's a smaller one. It's like 52 units. Uh, rents are under market right now should be about 900. Uh, but they're at, I think the average is like 650. So mom and pop owner, uh, you know, we'll go in, you probably put 150 grand into it, turning it, but it's going to be a nice place. Should be about 15% cash on cash when it's all done. So it just, um, you know, I think it just, you have to be patient and, you know, kind of wait for your pitch because you're not going to get a lot of them, you know, in this environment right now. But you know, if we do two a year, we're, we're in a pretty good spot. So Jake, it's the race to 80. You need to really look at 80 deals yeah. to underwrite to find that one deal in this market. And I'm not saying you have to drive out to 80, but you have to underwrite, look yeah. at those quick back of the napkin and that'll filter themselves down. So if you're looking at four deals a week, it's going to take you 20 weeks to find a deal. What, what areas of the country do you guys like and what areas do you not like? Uh, we are today, within, 2020. Today, yeah, yeah, we're within three hours of Knoxville. So we like the Southeast right to work places. Uh, some of the states have no income tax, a lot of job drivers, big, big companies coming down to these areas. And we do not like the blue states. I mean, with Trump, with Trump did with the tax. 
Say it again. You, you don't like what? We don't like the blue states. What Trump did with the tax law, with the property taxes in New York, they're going out in droves because the first 10 grand, you can't write off anything above 10 grand with property taxes. Right. And the affordable housing, see what's going on with the affordable housing laws in New York and California. It's killing them. And now California wants to do, wants to do the Prop 13 where they want to raise property taxes. People are going to flee. So you have to watch where those migra- migratory patterns are going. You can look at Phoenix. You can look at Boise. You can look at Nevada. You can look at Salt Lake City. You can look at Denver. These are all places that people are leaving California and middle-class well-paid people. It doesn't matter if, if California is supplanting them with other people. They're supplanting with immigrants, people who make less money, who have less skills. They're losing that skilled labor. Why did Toyota leave California and go to Texas? Not only because of the you know tax benefits, but because employees can make 80 grand a year and can afford to live in Dallas. So they move their whole operations from Toyota, from California to Texas. So Texas is going to continue to thrive. I think Florida is a little bit expensive right now, but going forward, I mean, look, the weather's great down here. The, the tax environment is great down here. I mean, people want to move down here. There's so many the jobs population down growth here. Is there the population too. growth yeah. is there. So the Southeast, you know, Jake calls it the Southeast Conference, the SEC. We like this area. We like North and South Carolina. Just be wary of when you go into the market, find out those submarkets. You really have to do a deep dive into those submarkets. We can go talk about this with hours, but just focus on those areas where people are moving and where there's job opportunities. That's awesome. Well, great, succinct advice. I appreciate that. So, guys, where can we get the honeybee? You get it on Amazon. You go to jakeandgino.com and uh, get yourself a copy. The Audible is coming out shortly. Depending on when this thing comes out, it might be already out. And you got the G Daddy reading that sucker. Man, he had a sweet, oh my God. That's sweet, a big sexy thing that voice. I had to, I had Boy, to read let me tell you what, they were they were in there like, man, you should do this full time. And he was thinking about leaving his multifamily for this. But uh, Not you know, a we're chance, gonna, we're gonna try to keep him on board. So I read I read my book and and then I got so many bad reviews on Amazon for that, that I said um and pause too much and I had to like literally redo it again and and like actually concentrate while doing it and uh, dude it's painful isn't it i mean you're sitting in office you're there for six hours stopping and reading the same thing over three times yeah something you wrote right yeah (laughs) Uh awesome dudes well well, listen i'm gonna put uh, guys i'm gonna put all their information i'm gonna put their website i'm gonna put um all their contact information social media links everything i'm gonna put a a link to the book and both of those and both of those things that they talked about and and it'll all be there. Uh, just go to hybendigital.com backslash Jake and Gino. Hybendigital.com backslash Jake, A-N-D, Gino, G-I-N-O. And, of course, uh, it'll all be there. Guys, this has been awesome. Thanks so much for contributing today. And I wish you the best of luck. And hopefully we'll get together and break some bread in the near future. Sounds great, cool. Pat. Thanks. Thanks, guys. I want you to think about the word toolbox. What is a toolbox? A toolbox is a box full of tools that you use to build something great. At Real Estate Rockstars, we've created our own free toolbox. So everybody that comes on the show as a guest brings a tool with them and we plow them all into this toolbox and we give it away for our viewing audience to basically use as they wish. Everything we put in there is an actionable item that can be downloaded, can be printed, can be used immediately. And we got things like scripts and dialogues, checklists for teams, checklists to keep agents accountable, referral forms that are filled out at settlement to get referrals by your buyers and sellers. Everything you could think of that you could use on a regular basis about real estate is included in this toolbox. And it's helping agents worldwide sell more houses and make their jobs a lot easier and processes much more efficient. And the thing is, it's absolutely free. All you got to do is go to hybendigital.com backslash toolbox or text the word toolbox to 444 444- 999 that's toolbox 444 999 do it now rockstar nation thank you for listening to real estate rockstars listen i need a favor if you find this free content helpful if you find our downloadable items from each guest helpful please i need you to pull out your pointing finger yes the one finger that points at people 
and hit subscribe. Yes, subscribe. The more subscribers we get, the better we look in the ratings and the easier it is to get guests like Robert Kiyosaki, Barbara Corcoran, all the players that are on million dollar listing in the different cities. All that stuff makes it easier the more subscribers we get. So please subscribe. And listen, there's a lot of places you can leave comments. There's a lot of places you can like. We're on Facebook. We have an Instagram page. Instagram page is I am Pat Hyben. The Facebook is Real Estate Rockstars Radio. Feel free to leave us comments there. The most popular form of commenting seems to happen on YouTube. Yes, for whatever reason, it's a, a very open environment. So just go to YouTube and go to Real Estate Rockstars Radio. Leave us comments there. Some of them we will read on the show. We love your feedback. So thanks, guys, and I hope you are having a great day. Oh, and also, listen, if you're going to subscribe and you haven't already left a review on iTunes, please do that too. Have a great day and thanks so much, Rockstar Nation. I really appreciate you.